This might be the craziest graph in biology. For billions of years, life stayed small, like bacteria. And then 500 million years ago, we had the Cambrian explosion, which created all of this big life, plants and fungi and animals. And even after five mass extinctions, we got mammals and then us homo sapiens. So today we're gonna to tell the story of this chart. And this chart has four big puzzles in it. Okay, now we're on our final question and our final puzzle. Why are chimp brains special? It's because they model and co-create a shared virtual reality. So chimp brains and human brains were able to model the world and were then able to co-create through language and things like this, this shared virtual reality that can exist separate from the world. Okay, let's talk about how those brains got created. Well, remember that here's our big vision here. We got the single cellular life. We had the Cambrian explosion. We got all these different body plans. We had the explosions into the sea, the land, and the air. And then finally we're over here and we're getting chimps and humans. And these are special creatures with a special intelligence. You know, they exist here. Here's where the chimps and the mountain gorillas and the bonobos are. They're hanging out. They're a function of the Cenozoic, right? They're in the forests, in these new broadleaf forests. They're climbing on trees, they're eating fruit, and they're in essentially a cognitive niche where it's helpful for them to be smart. It's helpful for their eyes to distinguish, you know, red to see the kind of fruit. And their cognitive niche was not a dead end for intelligence versus some of these other niches in these other intelligent creatures Something like an octopus, really smart. You know, we have about 100 billion neurons in a human brain. They have about a billion, two thirds of which are in their arms, which is crazy. <laughs> and that was good, but it didn't really, it couldn't go anywhere because they were in water. They can't help their young, all that stuff. We then later got like the corvids. These are the birds, something like a crow, also really smart, a billion neurons, but they don't have hands. That's not that helpful. And their brains couldn't get that big. And you even have things like social insects, which are another way to get intelligent, where they're doing, these are kind of honey pot ants, which are crazy. They've done division of labor where certain ants, all they do is they hold the honey in this amazing way. And so in something like this, each little creature has about a million neurons and there might be a hundred thousand of them. And so that gets you to a hundred billion neurons, but it's kind of all parallelized. Each creature is not that smart. They're only interacting through pheromones. And so yeah, chimps are special. And part of that is that they have a different way that they reproduce. So something like blue crabs produce 8 million eggs per year. They are selected they for rapidity in lots of people. While something like hyrax or an African elephant, an African elephant only has one calf every three to nine years. And so something like, you know, humans are similar. We have a kid every two years or whatever, and chimps are pretty similar, where you get to spend all this time and energy you have a big brain and then the creature beneath you, your little offspring also has a big brain. And so you get some of these graphs like this that show body weight versus brain weight. And you can see, yeah, here's the crow that we talked about earlier. Very smart for its weight, but not that big. And then it doesn't have hands and things. And then later on, you have some of these sperm whale, kind of big brain weight, etc. the elephant, big brain weight. And then here's man up here and here's chimpanzee. Here's a great graph that really shows how mammals exist on the certain axis, a certain relationship between body mass and brain mass. Then some of these non-human primates like chimps are kind of pushed up into the left where they have a more of a brain mass per body mass. And then hominids though are even crazier where you, know, you can see stuff like this. They've really pushed and they've totally changed the angle to say, you don't need to get that much bigger of a body mass to get a ton bra bigger brain mass. And that's why we have issues obviously birthing through the birth canal and hips and things like that. And this is a different way to view that graph where you can see, you know, millions of years ago, this is us kind of breaking off from chimps. That was a big moment and that was the start of our big brains. And that's where we're gonna kind of get to today. And then after that, we got these feedback loops that then gave us Australopithecus and then Homo creatures, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and then finally Homo sapiens and Neanderthals with these massive, massive brain cases and brain sizes. So how do chimp brains work? How do brains work in general? And why was that not a dead end for you know animal intelligence? Well, most of what I'm gonna talk about now is from this amazing book called A Brief History of Intelligence by Max Bennett. It's all linked to it in the doobity-doo. And so what he shows is that, yeah, we have our brains over time. You know, this is a human brain and Back in the day, you know, this isn't a perfect image of it, but yeah, we have this thinking brain and then a little bit of an emotional brain and this kind of like life brain at the beginning. 
And so this is the simple version, and he goes much deeper than this, obviously. And so he breaks it into kind of five different stages instead of those three, where we look at those early bilaterians and we say, what were their brains like? What can they do? Then once we got vertebrate fishes, what can they do? Then these mammals, these rats, what can their brains do? And then finally primates and then humans. And so what he shows here is that the bilaterians, they could do what's called steering, pretty simple steering. The vertebrates were able to do some reinforcing where they were able to start to do a little bit of learning. The mammals, you know, like those little rodents, they were able to start simulating to start saying, oh, what about this? What about this? And then primates were able to start mentalizing, kind of think about your mind and my mind. And then finally humans were able to do speaking. So let's go through each. Here's a simple picture of a bilaterian brain. This is C. elegans, one of these nematodes. And it only has like 301 neurons in it. So we've, we've mapped the whole thing. We know how it works and we can simulate it in silico now, which is really cool. And fundamentally, what it has is it has, it can either only do one of two things. It can either go forward or it can turn. <laughs> That's what a nematode can do. And so fundamentally, it has just these valence neurons, these little sensory neurons that tell it, oh, if there's food around, kind of hang out here. And if there's bad stuff around, kind of keep going and move on, you know? And what it ends up looking like is essentially a Roomba <laughs> where when you're hungry, you kind of go around, you do fast swimming, infrequent turns, and then when food is found, you do slow swimming, infrequent turns. You kind of hang out, you hang out, and then, ah, oh, you feel satiated and you rest. And what this shows is these behavioral states and these neurotransmitters that we also still have today. Something like dopamine says, hey, keep searching, keep doing local search. So something like adrenaline is like, oh, escape, get out of here. And then, you know, that's a negative valence, like get away from me, high arousal. But then high arousal positive valence is like, ooh, I'm searching, I'm searching, ooh, I found a cool thing, you know, we're exploiting. And then once you're there kind of hanging out, then once you're done, ah, you can do serotonin, do a little bit of positive valence, rest and digest. So that's when the food is in their little bellies. Instead of being out there in the world, once it's in their little bellies, they say, ah, oh, I'm just gonna hang out now and kind of chill. So that gives us pure steering where you're just taking in these sensory valence neurons and you're making them determine actions. Then after this, you know, bilaterian brain with steering, we get the vertebrate brain with some of these fish. And what fish can do is they can do this trial and error learning you know, this reinforcement learning. And the idea here is that their brains are a little bit bigger and they have a little bit of a, I think of it as a wrapper around the simple valence neurons. And what they can do is they can start to do trial and error learning. And they do that, you know, if you get a fish, a fish can do what's called temporal difference learning via dopamine, where it knows like, oh, if there's an actual reward at the end, like some food, instead of only giving itself reward, something like dopamine at the end, it gives itself a little bit of expected dopamine for each new state. And so you can feel that within humans. When I think about my phone and checking my phone, I don't get dopamine at the end. I get dopamine at the beginning where it says, ooh, you wanna do that. It's expectancy. It's providing you a little bit of motivation and expecting things because you learned that over time by getting yourself into a better and better states that then kind of propagate back through the network. Um, and so these vertebrate brains are very different than anything that had ever existed before where they don't just have nature. They also have a little bit of, you could call it like nurture or something where they can make these learned responses. They can change. It's not just their genes that determine who their behavior, but they can learn behavior in the course of their lifetimes. Then with, and then with mammals and things like these little rats and things 250 million years ago, these you know mice, they have a neocortex and what that thing does is it allows them to do a mental simulation. So instead of just trial and error in the real world, they can do trial and error in their own brains, which is really cool. So if you watch a mouse do a maze, what it'll do is it'll kind of look left and right and it'll play out in its brain. It'll say, oh, if I go this way, will I get something? Oh, if I go this way, will I get something? And so it's done a bunch of trial and error learning in person in reality, and then it can start to play those back as in its own brain. So it's kind of a wrapper, again, another wrapper that says, hey, let's start to simulate a little fake reality here. Instead of going that way and not getting food or going that way and getting hit by a car and dying or whatever, instead I can have ideas die in my stead. I can have an idea go out there in the world. Ooh, should I, should I walk across the street right now? Ooh, that's a bad idea. I would get hit by a car. So instead I'm gonna not do that. This is kind of what that looks like. Again, another wrapper, this mental simulation of the world in the neocortex where you're simulating the brain. You know what the brain does, you know these trial and error learnings, and you're simulating it instead of having to do those things in person. 
And then finally, what the primates can do is they can simulate the simulations or you can simulate other people's simulations. So that's what's called mentalizing, where you're able to think about thinking, to model one's own inner simulation. And so what this gives you is it allows you to think about your own future needs. You can say, oh, if I was there later, do I want ice cream? Yeah, I do want ice cream. Oh, it also allows you to look at others and to kind of imitate them. And so I can look at someone else and be like, oh, they're doing this for this reason. Oh, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. I'll do that too. That's the theory of mind too, where you're not just able to simulate your own brain, but you're able to simulate somebody else's brain. And so chimps can do this. They have a theory of mind. They can understand that there are a whole set of brains out there. They can imitate them and they can understand what the brains are doing and why. So here's a great image that shows, that kind of synthesizes all these, where at the beginning, you just have a reward, you know, categorizing stimuli in the world into good and bad. And then that allows you to do reinforcement learning where you know what's good and bad. And so you can do trial and error with it. And you can start to understand how your actions then make good or bad outcomes later on. Then you can start to do simulation where you learn through vicarious trial and error. Then you can do mentalizing where you simulate your own simulation and other people's simulations. And then finally with language, we can start to share those simulations with others. That's the beautiful thing that we're doing right now is that not only do we can we imitate each other, not only do we have a theory of mind with each other, but I can create this new, this shared model. I can co-create a shared virtual reality for both of us to exist in. And I can say, now we're with a unicorn and we're dancing with a woman and a man and they're hanging out with Adam and Eve and blah, blah. It's like, wow, that's amazing that I can do that with language. And again, in the brain, this is all done because each new layer is trying to explain the layer beneath it, where you're trying to kind of model and simulate the layer beneath it. And then Max Bennett has this one final thing that I love, which is that, you know, there's this AI theme of more data equals more performance. And that's also seen in evolution, where you can see here, there is this, you know, at the beginning, you can learn from your own actual actions. You can do trial and error learning. You'd say, oh man, I messed up there. And so you're learning from yourself, your actual actions. Later, a mammal, can learn from your own imagined actions. The ideas can die in your stead. And then with early primates, you can do mentalizing where you learn from others' actual actions. Where I look at you making a little tool, or I look at you making something like, oh, I can do that, I can imitate that. And then finally, with speaking in early humans, you can learn from others' imagined actions, not just their real actions. But I can tell you and say, hey, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, oh, I can kind of imagine that. I should or should not do that. And so yeah, what all of this does is it gets us as little chimps first in the forests and then you know as you know australopithecus and the homo genera out onto the grasslands we start to exist with each other in this new cultural fabric where we're able to model and co-create and share these worlds with each other we're able to make tools and imitate each other's tools and we exist in this new cognitive niche and then eventually that cognitive niche turns into language where we're able to just purely create these shared virtual worlds with each other. And of course, coming back to the big theme of this whole series on how everything evolved, that allows us to transition purely from the library of genes to the library of ideas, where before we had atoms and blah, 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 and we made the universe and the periodic table and everything. And then on earth and on some other plants, we got this library of genes, pretty exciting, the origin of life, micro life, and then macro life. And then one of those pieces Pieces of macro life, you know, multicellular life, chimps, they had this organ called brains, and those brains, it had 100 billion neurons, and those neurons could start to, you know, simulate actions, and then start to imitate actions, and then start to, with language, share actions and share this new virtual reality, which created this whole library of ideas, which created all of civilization and modernity as we know it. So, we've showed this amazing graph, we're here today, we're done with the tree of life, which is kind of cool. I feel kind of done with it, you know? It's like, oh God, I've recorded so many videos on this. <laughs> if you missed it in this video, I mean, well done. You, I give you a big cookie. You know, today we were talking about macro life, but I also talked about, there's a great video that talks all about micro life in the first kind of 3 billion years of life on earth. And so I'll link to that near my face here. Thank you as always for listening. And let me know if you have any comments or questions in the little doobity doo below. Bye.